Welcome back to WD. FM, the official Walt Disney Family Museum podcast. We're your hosts, Bree Bertolaccini, Content and Research Manager. And Chris Mullen, Marketing and Editorial Specialist at the Walt Disney Family Museum. Happy May and welcome back, Chris. Glad to be back. Excited for this episode. Yeah, there's been a lot happening at the Walt Disney Family Museum since we last talked, so I thought it would be a good idea to just jump into some of those museum updates. Let's start with probably more of my favorite thing to talk about is the new exhibition that we have on display. We recently opened the Art of Disneyland Attraction posters on display in our lower lobby gallery. From the early years of Disneyland to today, upon entering the front gate, rows of vibrant posters promoting Disneyland's exciting attractions can be seen. Serving as both decoration and savvy in-park advertising, these artistic posters are a notable part of Disneyland's unique storytell strategy. Now, a collection of original posters were curated to depict what was awaiting guests on Disneyland's opening day on July 17th, 1955. This exhibition is free to view and can be seen now through August 18th, 2024. Now, Chris, what is your favorite part of this exhibition? Well, I'm glad that you asked. Uh, My favorite part of this exhibition is the big rocket jets graphic. I love the mid-century space age design, and it really kind of adds a kinetic element to the gallery that goes beyond just the individual framed posters, which are all also very cool as well. What about you? Yeah, I do also agree. I love the the Rocket Jets graphic. A long time ago, I mean, this is now like dating me a little bit. We had a Tomorrowland exhibition. I think kind of coinciding, I know it was uh, curated by Brad Bird around the time that Tomorrowland was uh, debuting in theaters. And we had those same Rocket Jets. And so I always remember that from the Tomorrowland exhibition. <laughs> so I'm like glad that they're making their way back. I'm sure they were, they're not the same. Um, the same graphics, but uh, I just love that kind of display and that retro effect. So yeah, I would have to say I I do love all the posters. Chris, you have a great uh, New York World's Fair poster behind you, I'm noticing. (laughs) Yeah, I do love all the posters, and I think that they're all so um, interestingly designed. But I would have to say there is a special object that's on display that really just has my heart, and it's this Mary Blair mosaic of its small world. Now, the case below the stairs has been home to many objects over the years celebrating Mary Blair's legacy, so I'm just always extra excited to have a new object for Mary in this case again. This mosaic is a conceptual design of the Disneyland facade of It's a Small World, and it utilizes different styles of tiles to make up the unique design. So it's definitely something you should make your way down to the lower lobby to see. It's definitely a treat. It's a small mosaic of It's a Small World. That's it. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Well, speaking of exhibitions, our uh, larger scale exhibition, Disney Cats and Dogs, is in its final month, sadly, after being extended due to popular demand. It is closing Sunday, June 2nd, 2024. Celebrate the closing of this incredibly popular special exhibition with us at a special Community Day event at the Walt Disney Family Museum. Join us, along with local pet-focused organizations, for an opportunity to learn about pet care, sample pet products, create pet-inspired art, and meet adoptable senior dogs from Muttville and service dogs from Canine Companions. This will take place on June 2nd from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. with events on our museum lawn and in our theater. It should be the perfect capstone to a very successful exhibition. I know I'm really sad to see this one go. It is free to attend the activities held on the lawn, and all ages are welcome. Some of the art activities that will be held is live animal sketching, where you can create your very own mini pet painting, or craft your very own 3D paper pet. Another option is to bring to life your drawing using a zoetrope to create the illusion of movement. We will also be screening 101 Dalmatians in our theater. So visit our website for a full calendar of events. And if you thought those exhibitions weren't enough, well, each month our collections team has curated a special object to be put on display in our awards lobby to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Walt Disney Company. This month we have a special miniature vase on display, which I'm sure Bree is very excited about (laughs) because it is Miniature May. Comprising nearly 2,000 miniatures, only a fraction of Walt's collection housed at the museum can be exhibited at one time. The remaining assortment is kept safely behind the scenes in climate-controlled storage. Walt collected, crafted, and curated a breadth of miniatures, including ceramics, 
glassware, silver cutlery, paper books and magazines, wooden furniture, musical instruments, dolls, faux fruits, candelabras, checkers and playing cards, and real working firearms. Uh, Currently, the exhibitions and collections teams are collaborating to make new custom storage containers for this comprehensive, small-scale collection. Uh, But Bree is the miniature master here, so I'll let you go into more detail about it. Yes, I'm going to be very interested to learn about the the custom storage containers that Collections is developing. So more on that later, um, later as in later in the year, <laughs> not in this episode. Um, but to go back, so this vase, which stands just at one and a quarter inches tall, is finely crafted porcelain, enamel, and gilding. So some of the hand painted brushstrokes are the width of a human hair. So just imagine kind of putting that together and the detail work that uh, went into making this one tiny little vase. Now, this is part of a set of miniature porcelain vessels by the same artist, each with a different shape and design. On this vase, there is a a Chinese-inspired dragon on it. And in Chinese tradition, dragons are symbols of prosperity and heavenly goodwill. Therefore, they are popular figures on pottery. Now, see this object now on display in our awards lobby. Also, join us in our theater this month for a special month-long screening of the Academy Award-winning animated feature, Big Hero 6. Based on the popular Marvel comic book series, Big Hero 6 is the story of a teenage robotics prodigy and Baymax, a healthcare robot, who team up with a group of first-time crime fighters to save the day and learn about the power of friendship. Plus, if you're a fan of our Disney Cats and Dogs exhibition... Get all the mochi that you can handle uh, at one of these screenings. Uh, Visit our calendar for showtimes. Can't wait to see Big Hero 6 in our theater. I love that movie. Um, It's so good. And I love Little Mochi. So great way to close out uh, one of the last couple of weeks of that exhibition. Now, calling all students looking for ways to get creative this summer, spots are still available in our upcoming summer classes. Class titles include Dialogue Animation, The Story Quest, Creatures, Aliens, Monsters, Charcoal Fundamentals, Light and Shadow, Digital Puppet Animation, Costume Design, Eras, Set Design, Fabrication, and Unconventional Material Animation. Scholarships are also available, so visit our website to learn more. A superhero duo of programs was just announced. Join us on Saturday, May 18th, as artivist, illustrator, and children's book author Nicholas Smith reads Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, The Courage to Dream, an inspiring picture book about a young Wakandan who hopes to become one of the Dora Milaje, the warriors who protect Wakanda. This book, Black Panther Wakanda Forever, The Courage to Dream, is currently available for purchase in the museum store. Then join us for a special presentation as Smith shares his work at the intersection of art and activism, creating illustrations for films, books, apparel, and campaigns for social change. Smith created illustrations that were used in Marvel Studios' film Black Panther Wakanda Forever and designed movie posters for the first Black Panther and Disney and Pixar's Soul. He is the creator of the 2023 Marvel Artist Series in collaboration with Target for an apparel line featuring black superheroes. Prior to his current work as an illustrator and children's book author, Smith designed theme parks at Walt Disney Imagineering for 11 years. Please note, these are separately ticketed events. The Storytime program begins at 11 a.m. with the talk following at 2 p.m. Should be a really good time. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to that program and hearing more from Nicholas about his career in Imagineering and also with Marvel. Like, There's just so much uh, to dig into his, his career as well as this beautifully illustrated children's book. So lots of fun things are happening right now at the Walt Disney Family Museum. Um, But now on WDFM, it is time for our favorite part of the episode, Collections Clash. Let's take a look back at the results from last round. The theme was the color green, and it was quite the colorful match, Chris. For the first round, I won the round with my pick of the Disneyland e-ticket against Chris's pick of the Jiminy Cricket maquette. You can't beat a true e-ticket attraction, I've, <laughs> I've learned. Uh, for round two, it was the closest a round has ever been. It came down to two votes that secured a win for my selection of the Pastoral Symphony concept artwork against Bree's pick of the Snow White and the Seven Dwarves Cartier bracelet. 
every vote counts. <laughs> and with those two votes, you won the entire clash with your pick of the Lionel Mickey Mouse hand car against my pick of the Mickey Mouse tricycle. So congrats, Chris, on your third win in a row. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, the people love trains. We we know <laughs> that. Um, this month, spring is in the air. I've got my nice springy green shirt on, uh, and we are looking towards the lush botanicals that can be found throughout the museum. The theme this month is flowers and trees. And now, while there are many artworks that feature flowers and trees, respectively, let's do a quick highlight of the Academy Award-winning short, Flowers and Trees, that inspired the name of this month's theme. The 1932 short, Flowers and Trees, had actually begun production in black and white. The cartoon presented the story of a romance between two anthropomorphized trees set against the drama of their woodland home coming under attack by a decaying stump. Walt had long been interested in color. He recalled, quote, The color of the film at the time was not good. It hadn't met with too much success in the theaters because there was a certain blurry quality to it, end quote. Technicolor introduced an intricate process in which three separate rolls of film, red, green, and blue, were combined into one saturated and vibrant image. Walt Disney Productions made an exclusive deal with Technicolor to utilize this new process, and the perfect short to use was already in production. Walt decided to redo the coloring of Flowers and Trees and brought color to the short. Flowers and Trees was a hit success. It, it really is hard to imagine now over 90 years later how exciting it would have been to see the vibrancy of the color for the very first time when watching Flowers and Trees. So just a, it's kind of fun to – we take it for granted, the idea of that vibrant color. Um, but it really set Disney apart from all other animated shorts at the time. Flowers and Trees was one of those characteristic gambles that, with the benefit of hindsight, appear at regular intervals across Walt's career, seemingly always at times when his business and creativity were in jeopardy. It seemed to really bring the best out of him. And, you know, risk necessitated risk. And with risk can come great reward. And Walt picked up his first competitive Academy Award for the short. Yeah, well, and it was the first Academy Award in that category's history. What we know as Best Animated Short uh, started then as Best Cartoon uh, Short Subject. And Walt would then dominate that category for the next decade, which showed just like Bree said, how far ahead color and other advancements during this period made Walt's short films. And, you know, it was really the perfect gamble to make. Other movie studios at the time were looking at Technicolor and felt like it was too expensive to go to their new process. But, you know, Walt with his short films felt like that was the the right risk for him to make. And it changed the the color of films uh, for decades to come. So we are very grateful that Walt did that for Flowers and Trees. And now we have all the great paint colors that uh, Disney's ink and paint department cooked up and uh, now we have color cartoons uh, and Walt to thank for that. Yeah, definitely. And I do really just love how Walt always throughout his career like was never content with the current innovations of filmmaking and that he really saw that innovation in filmmaking was necessary in order to put like you know, get more people to want to watch his films. I think that's more of the idea <laughs> behind it. You see that with Steamboat Willie, Innovation and in Sound, and then Flowers and Trees, Innovation and in Color, and then even Snow White. And, you know, I think the list can keep going on. But with that, Chris, since you won last round, you get the first pick. Well, for my first floral pick, I'm going with the elegant Bambi backgrounds that we have on display. Uh, Tyrus Wong, Bambi's lead artist, inspired the film's distinct artistic style. His artistic approach to Bambi differed greatly from the studio's previous films, which had been known for their highly detailed animation. Wong was influenced by Art of the Song Dynasty, an era of Chinese history that lasted from 960 to 1279 A.D., uh, the art of this time was minimalistic, which used only the subject's most prominent lines to create emotional appeal. Wong's style used details mainly in the foreground and colorful, delicate, and simple backgrounds to establish the scene's atmosphere. That's such a great pick, Chris. Uh, those Tyrus Wong artworks on display are just so serene and beautiful, and the lightest touches create that hint of that lush background in those trees, and just like the smallest little dash of a branch um, can really like paint that beautiful picture. So, great pick. For my first pick, I'm going with the Ivan Earl backgrounds from Sleeping Beauty. 
In these backgrounds, you see the iconic Ivan Earl style of trees that include very hyper detailed bark on the trees and then the square shaping of the branches. Now, Earl worked as a background artist and would eventually be chosen by Walt to style and paint all the key backgrounds for Sleeping Beauty, giving the film a distinct style. Earl made decisions for character designs and color schemes for the film and gave the film a consistent visual style from beginning to end. The production for Sleeping Beauty notoriously took far longer to complete than any other Disney animated features, taking over six years. Part of the reason the film's long production was the level of artistic devotion and attention to detail, which you can definitely see in these backgrounds for the film done by Earl. A normal background on a Disney film might have taken a day to complete. An Ivan Earl background, however, could have taken as many as 10 days to complete. We have three of Earl's backgrounds on display in our galleries where you can see the immense detail put into these artworks. And what I particularly love about them is the detailed trees juxtaposed against the simplicity of the other elements of nature, like the sprouts of grass are sparse, but just give the hint of that forest ground. Um, And also, the next time you go to Disneyland, make sure to keep an eye out for Ivan Earl's iconic square trees that make up the lush trees that surround Sleeping Beauty's castle. It's always my favorite thing to point out. (laughs) Well, uh, that's also a very great pick. Uh, Ivan Earl's backgrounds uh, are so great. It makes the film look like a moving tapestry like Walt wanted. And it's definitely a main reason why that film is is right up there with with one of my favorites. So great selection. And since this is a snake style draft, you get the next pick. Well, for my second pick, I'm going with Gustav Tengren's visual development artwork for the 1937 Silly Symphony short, The Old Mill. Now, this artwork depicts the old mill in the background, and in the foreground, there's a spider weaving its web, and adorning the edges are a variety of flowers and mushrooms. Now, Tengren was a Swedish children's book illustrator, and his artwork at the Disney Studios was extremely influential for shorts like The Old Mill, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and Pinocchio, to name a few projects. His illustration style evokes European fairy tales and was heavily influenced by John Bauer and Arthur Rackham. Well, uh, Rackham up, uh, Brie. That was a great <laughs> a great pick. And for uh, my second pick, uh, I'm staying in 1937, staying in that very same year, uh, and I'm not missing the forest for the trees. I'm going with the cell of Snow White running through these scary trees. Uh, Beyond Bambi, which was my first pick, few of the early Disney animated features utilized nature as a true character in the story the way that Snow White did. Snow White running through the forest was a genuinely terrifying scene and went along with Walt's ethos about filmmaking. Just because something is made with a family audience in mind doesn't mean that it can't have scary elements or deal with heavy themes. So scary trees it is. And, you know, going along with your Tengren pick, you can really see when you go from like a Snow White to a Sleeping Beauty just how much styling is going on in these films. You might think, you know, Disney features, especially during Walt's lifetime, uh, really share a lot of uh, visual cues, a lot of the character design. You know, if they're not very similar, then they kind of rhyme in a way. Uh, But you can miss just how differently scenes are set up and laid out and the different choices that go along with making those in each of the films that, uh, just differ so wildly depending on what kind of art style they were going with. So I love the way that those choices were made for Snow White, just like I love the way that they were done for Pinocchio or for Sleepy Beauty in just completely different ways. That is such a great pick. I love the, you know that juxtaposition of Snow White and Sleeping Beauty. Thanks for weaving that tapestry together, Chris. Um, but yeah, those moments and how they bring to life those scary trees and kind of just like evoking that kind of fairy tale, um, those kind of fables within this artwork is just very, um, it's very scary and very evocative. I love it. So great pick. And you have the next selection. Well, for my last pick, I'm going a little more abstract and maybe a little bit more literal about flowers and trees, and I'm picking Walt's Conservation Awards. Now, Walt Disney, of course, is celebrated not only for his transformative and lasting impact on our culture through the pioneering and perfecting of animation, family entertainment, and theme parks, but also for his reverence of nature and support for habitat conservation. Consistently ahead of his time, Walt recognized the importance of inspiring younger generations to both 
understand and actively protect our natural world and the diverse forms of life with which we share the planet. Now, Walt paired never-before-seen wildlife film footage with enriching storytelling in the Academy Award-winning True Life Adventures series, the first of its kind to expose the greater public through film to the importance and diversity of nature. Audiences were transported to the plains, deserts, mountains, waterways, and forests of our planet, not as mere background scenery for human activity, but as real, balanced ecosystems that support a variety of fascinating creatures. The True Life Adventures films ultimately fueled a mainstream appreciation of wildlife conservation, created the template for the modern nature documentary, and set many conservationists on their career paths. I love that interpretation and just that really was a cornerstone of one of Walt's like passions was conservation and um, that came through with True Life Adventures starting all the way back again, weaving that tapestry to an earlier pick to Bambi and how those kind of early realizations that we did have to protect our natural world. So great pick. For my last pick, I'm going with the cleanup animation drawings for the 1935 Silly Symphony short, Water Babies. I love the Silly Symphonies, if you can't tell. (laughs) Uh, Two of my three picks are from the Silly Symphonies. Now, these drawings on display depict the water babies on parade with different parade floats adorned with flowers. On the first one, there is a turtle swimming with flowers. Uh, The one in the middle is a leaf made into a boat with water babies holding a flower like an umbrella. It's so cute. And the last one is more elaborate and features swans as parade floats with many water babies riding on top with lots of flowers everywhere. Now, around the drawings are handwritten notes from the animators noting the colors to be used. This colorful short is a perfect splash based on the Charles Kingsley story depicting tiny fairy folk. A sequel, Mer Babies, was released in 1938. Great pick. Love a Mer Babies pick, always. <laughs> Um, And now it's time for our honorable mentions. These will not be up for voting. When it comes to iconic Disney floral arrangements, my mind immediately goes to the Mickey Mouse floral arrangement in front of the Main Street train station at Disneyland. So my first honorable mention is the Mickey Mouse floral arrangement on our model of the Disneyland of Walt's imagination. Such a great pick. And it's so iconic when you're walking through the gates at Disneyland to be greeted with that um, floral Mickey Mouse that's been there from, you know, the early days of Disneyland, um, as well as those uh, we were talking about earlier, the attraction posters. So kind of those two very iconic things when you're first walking into the park that have kind of stayed consistent. But I love this very floral pick. And if you're going with something on the model, I'll also make a selection from there as well. So my first honorable mention is my favorite tree at Disneyland, and I love it even more in a miniature form. (laughs) It's the petrified tree in Frontierland. Now, the full-sized one at Disneyland is approximately 50 to 77 million years old. The one on our model is almost 15 years old. So there's that. (laughs) (laughs) Walt and Lillian stopped at Pike's Petrified Forest in Colorado Springs on July 11th, 1956, just two days shy of their 31st wedding anniversary. And as a tongue-in-cheek story, the Petrified Tree was presented to Disneyland by Mrs. Disney because it was, quote, too big for the mantle. Well, uh, well picked. Uh, the <laughs> oldest thing at Disneyland. Uh, yeah. and found a way to work that in. Uh, my second honorable mention is a bit of a reach, so stick with me. Optical printer number two. Now, some of the best visuals of flowers and trees in live action Disney history went through this printer. The iconic chalk drawing sequence of Mary Poppins, the forced perspective of shots for films like Darby O'Gill and the Little People and the No Mobile, and filtering effects on nature films like the True Life Adventures were all made possible by this machine. So, In a way, it's not itself flowers and trees, but it helped uh, bring to life uh, many flowers and trees in Disney productions. So I thought that that fit. You love any excuse to talk about that optical printer number two. Oh, yeah. (laughs) It's almost like uh, calling back to the early days of this podcast when uh, every pick was somehow related to Walt skis. Oh, yeah. (laughs) The optical printer is your new Walt skis. (laughs) Well, since this collection's clash, we are celebrating the flora and the fauna. I thought for my second honorable mention, I would celebrate one of the most important floras in Walt's life, his mother. I'm going with a photograph of flora on display in our first gallery. Walt remembered his mother for her humor. He recalled to journalist Pete Martin, quote, my mother had a sense of humor. 
We could get around her and get anything out of our mother. She even connived with us against our dad. She would say, all right now, just keep it from your father. No use to tell your father about this. That's all we wanted to hear, end quote. Now, Flora would live to see her sons, Walt and Roy, achieve success in their business. Walt recalled, quote, she was very happy and very proud of Roy and I and what we'd done. Wow, a great way to, to tie into Mother's Day that we just celebrated. Exactly. So, <laughs> and final honorable mention. Uh, for my last honorable mention, I wanted to take it back to the family part of the Walt Disney Family Museum, much like you did, a photograph of Diane holding her bouquet of flowers at her wedding. Beyond their aesthetic value, flowers are such a great symbol for many things, including love. So I thought that, that was a, a meaningful last honorable mention for the flowers and trees of our museum to bring it right back to the family. I love that. Such a great pick. And for my last honorable mention and celebration of Miniature May, since we didn't do the theme again of miniatures for the month of May for our collections clash, I'm keeping it small and going with miniature plates that are on display that feature a variety of flowers and kind of different styles. So as part of this collection that's on display in our miniature gallery, this collection of serving ware is just a small portion of Walt's miniatures collection. He sourced miniatures from his travels, and many of them are hand-painted from a variety of different eras. Um, and so when you look at these little plates, you'll see so many um, kind of Victorian era flowers. There's, there's a little serving platter that to me, it looks a little bit more of that like um, kind of groovier early 50s, late 60s kind of style. Um, and then you just get kind of the, the French Rococo style uh, on some of those plates that kind of feature some great trees and obviously some cool little scenes between, you know, a man and a woman and uh, kind of the courting that went on. Um, so lots to see on these itty bitty little plates. And one of these special ceramics is currently on display in our awards lobby. So um I'll tie it back. <laughs> well, uh, picking a serving plate was quite the serve, and uh, that's a good place for us to uh, end this episode. Visit our Instagram stories today, Thursday, May 16th, to vote on your favorite objects or email us at podcast at wdfmuseum.org to cast your votes or even share your thoughts and comments. Thanks for tuning in to WDFM, the official Walt Disney Family Museum podcast. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on all social channels at WDF Museum for all of the latest updates. Stop and smell the flowers and keep moving forward. <laughs>